All right, Entree Architect community, it's 4 p.m. Eastern, which means it's time for the Entree Architect Context and Clarity live conversation for Thursday, October 21st, 2021. Thanks for joining us today. As you get here, say hi. Let us know that you're here and let us know where you're joining the conversation from. If we've never met before, my name is Jeff. I'm in Indianapolis and I come here every weekday afternoon at 4 p.m. Eastern for one reason so that we can find clarity around the things that matter most to you, the architect. It doesn't matter if you're the employee of a firm or you own your own firm. You may have circled a date on the calendar and said, 2021 is my year, and you may be on the runway to starting your own thing, or you may have owned your own firm for a year or 10 years or 26 years, and you may be rethinking or reimagining what that firm could or maybe even should be. All of the talks that we cover, one topic every day, they all fall under the broad umbrella of the business of architecture, and they're all the need-to-know topics for the success of small firm architects just like you. So as you get here, say hi. Let us know that you're here. we got a big number up in, the, up, up, up in the upper left corner of our screen right now, so I know you, all of you haven't said hi yet. Let us know that you're here and where you're joining the conversation from. If you've never joined a Context and Clarity before, uh, it is not at all unusual for us to have a live audience literally from around the world, from uh, from Anaheim, California to Australia. Uh, as we wrap the globe. So uh, let us know that you're here. Uh, I see Ed Shannon from Des Moines, Iowa. I see James Petty from New York. Welcome to all of you. Olga, I know, is over in uh, Moscow, Russia. So great to have you and many others. Uh, I want to let you know that there is maybe a, an unfamiliar face on the screen right now. I'm joined today by my special guest co-host, Mandy Freeland. Mandy, welcome. Hi, everybody. I'm filling in for Catherine today. So I will be checking out your comments and um, highlighting them. If you guys have anything, any questions you guys want. Um, hello, everybody. Thanks. Thanks for having me today, Jeff. Um, happy to do this. But uh, I'll, I'll try and highlight your comments if I, if I can see them, okay? Yep. Perfect. And if you're showing up, if you're looking at the screen right now, especially if you're joining us from Facebook, uh, if you're joining us from the Entree Architect Community Facebook page, uh, if you're showing up as Facebook user rather than, I see John Jones has joined us from Westport, Connecticut. I see John's name. I see his, his profile picture there. But if you're showing up as Facebook user, that's because you're coming in from the Facebook group. It's a private group. Facebook has uh, privacy policies which say that your uh, name and likeness can't leave the group unless you give it permission. So if you would like to show up like Troy does, hi, Troy, or no, Troy's on, on LinkedIn. Hi, Troy from LinkedIn. Um, who, who, uh, who do I see that is Jake Flinton? He's joining us from uh, East Aurora, New York from Facebook. If you want to show up like Jake does, but you're showing up as Facebook user right now, go to the URL that's at the bottom left of your screen right now. It's chat dot restream dot io slash fb uh in other words facebook so chat dot restream dot io slash fb as in facebook and uh, go through a very quick easy painless process of allowing facebook to let your name and likeness out and you'll show up just like jake does instead of like Facebook user, but that's that's up to you. Uh, great to have all of you here with us today. Great to see you on all the different channels that we're simulcasting to right now. Um, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitch, and YouTube all at the same time. So it's great to have all of you. And also to those of you listening to us in the future on the podcast version, hello, thanks for listening in. If, uh, if you didn't know that, we take the audio version of this and publish it as a podcast every Monday afternoon at, at noon Eastern. Um, go to wherever you consume podcasts and look for the Context and Clarity podcast, and you will find the audio version of this conversation. So great to have all of you. Uh, keep, keep saying hello. Keep uh, introducing yourselves and letting, letting us know where in the world you are. I know that I'm just kind of glancing. We are across the U.S. right now, and I think we've jumped over to the U.K. as well. So, uh, oh, but but Olga is in in Russia, so we're, we're probably getting close to halfway around the globe at this point. So, great to have you all here. Um, got a lot of people here expecting our guest today, which is fantastic. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. It's a very popular uh, architect as developer is a very popular topic. 
not just in the entry architect community, but I think in a lot of the architecture community around the world. And so uh, our guest today is a pioneer and an educator. He's an architect, a developer, and an expert witness. He's developed over 300,000 square feet of construction and is the owner of an award-winning car collection, by the way. He's the founder of the architecture and development firm that bears his name and the creator of the Architect as Developer courses. Jonathan Siegel, welcome to Context and Clarity Live. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. It's great to have you here today. Uh, like I said, architect as developer is a really popular topic. Um, there may be some romanticized versions out there in people's heads, but but obviously with people like you in the profession and the course that you teach and everything else, it's a very real thing. So one of the things I'm curious about, you know, a lot of times we talk about professional backstories, but I think with you, this goes all the way back to when you were in school, doesn't it? Um, the, I always kind of wanted to do my own thing. Actually, in the beginning, I wanted to do my own architectural company. And my world has been pretty much serendipity ever since I was a young kid. And things just happen. I don't you know, really plan that much, even though I do try to plan. Um, and, uh, you know, got out of school, got to San Diego, was going to work for two firms for two years each, a big one and a small one. And uh, then was on a board of directors downtown in San Diego called the Center City Development Corporation's Residence Advisory Committee and met a guy that was doing a project. And I said, hey, would you please look at my thesis project that I did in school because I'd like to do some row houses downtown. And this guy, Charles, um, said to me, uh, you know, he's actually pretty mean. He said, you know, don't be an idiot. You don't want to be an architect. You want to be a developer. Develop your own project. And uh, the rest is sort of history. His mother had a lot of land, had no money. And um uh, he said, buy this property for $50 a square foot. It was about a 7,500 square foot triangular lot. And I'll give you six months to, you know, to close. And um, then it just sort of took off from there. And that was really good. And then uh, we built seven row houses and the whole economy just took a dump. And that was like 91, 90 that it took that dump. And uh, we made a half a million dollars the first year in profit. And then the next year we made $35,000. So um it's you know it's an interesting program now you know everything's more consistent we got out of for sale housing into for rent housing um we were a little bit ahead of the curve on that and uh it's made for a pretty stable lifestyle well that's that's good but how did you so so you meet charles and he's his mom has some property and you get into this how did you learn it? I mean, it sounds like maybe it's trial by fire, but how did you learn how the, how to do the development side of everything? Well, you know, let's back up and say, you know, what does it take to put a building together? Take someone with a piece of land, take someone to do a drawing, someone to understand a product type, um, and then someone to build it. And if you start thinking about the skill set that the architects have, um, they don't have the piece of land, but you can acquire that. All the other skill sets all of us architects have. We understand the product type. We understand the research if we don't. Um, we understand how to do a set of drawings. And we understand, you know, what comes in front of the next piece to build a building. Um, so the key to success is really to do your research and to do, you know, small baby steps and grow s slowly and incrementally. Um, you'll make a lot of mistakes. Um, but if you can make them small enough, you can correct those mistakes and then you can capitalize on them. So if you develop something that you really wanted to have certain rooms a little bit taller, a little bit bigger, you can always change that. But if you offer that idea to the owner, per se, um, they're going to benefit from it and you're not going to get any monetary gain on that. Um, so by controlling all the parts and actually owning the product when you're done, you will capitalize on all of your hard work. And, and as most architects know, you know, we tend to put in more hours than we bill. Um, and we tend to go much further out to make something better than um, any of the other people in the triangle. The triangle being, you know, the owner, the architect, and the contractor. Um, we we don't like that triangle. We like the round circle with everybody in the middle. That's the owner. That's me. The architect. That's me. And the contractor. That's me. So when we're all here, we're all happy with each other. We're all giving the big group hug, and, and we're all liking each other, right? No one's screaming. No one's writing threatening letters and stuff. But whereas you have that triangle, you know, the, there's the owner and the contractor 
you know, they, they, they make nice, you make nice, you make nice in the beginning, and then the architect then slowly is getting cheated on and divorced to where the owner comes over and starts talking to the contractor here, and then they get all married up and they hate you now because you're making all the mistakes, or so the contractor is telling the owner this. And then the owner isn't liking the delays, the owner isn't liking the, the change orders. So th this is not synergetic. This is, it's problematic. You know, it, it just doesn't make any sense. No one has the same vested interest um, in that triangle. Um, and uh, granted, it does work out, but uh, in, in my world, it's never been the case. There's always been these people pulling and pointing fingers and so forth. So that's the, 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 the brief explanation to your question. <laughs> so why, why aren't more architects doing what you do? Why aren't more architects operating as developers as well? I think there's a fear. I mean, if you really look at it, it is general math. There's nothing magic about it. Um, you know, you got to put your head down and keep every morning you wake up, there's that big ball in front. You got to keep pushing it. Um, you have to have perseverance. Um, I just don't think the architects know the program. I, you know, I, as, as we discussed, I have an online course that basically outlines, you know, from the beginning to the end, how to do everything and gives you all the contracts and all the documents to, to go through and, and utilize. It really is a basic process. It's, it's all about decisions. So, you know, if you have sort of like two things, bad information creates a bad decision. You know, good information will help you create a good decision, but you got to make the right decisions. If you can't make good decisions, you're not going to, it's not going to work out for you because you'll be hit and barraged by just massive amounts of, of bad news and problems that you have to wade through. Um, and if you can make proper decisions along the way, it, it'll work out and it works out well. And, and then hopefully, um, You'll create a better city, a better environment, or better wherever you're working out of um, that everybody will benefit from. And uh, hopefully then you'll get some recognition. Maybe you get published and maybe you get some awards. And then finally, hopefully, you know, there's a financial thing that happens at the end and uh, works out pretty well for you. For anybody out there that wants to know more about the online course or courses, actually, that uh, Jonathan was just talking about, go to architectasdeveloper.com and uh, you'll, you'll find all the information there uh, about uh, the variety of courses that uh, Jonathan has developed over the, over the years to help out with this. We've got a comment here, Mandy. What's this? Um, so Mark asks... What's the scariest situation you've ever found yourself in as a developer and how did you work it out? Um, well, there's so many of them. Um, I can try and be part of a recent one. Um, and that was, we tried to hire subcontractors that are of our scale. So the analogy would be if you ever, you know, want to get in and spar in a boxing match, you don't want to go against a heavyweight. And obviously if you're a heavyweight, you want to go, against a, a smaller lightweight. Well, we, we um, had um, a subcontractor that was electrical contractor and uh, we had three bidders. He was the low bidder magic, isn't it? Uh, so we took the low bidder and he was a large company, did about $180 million worth of electrical work. And it was so poorly managed, it was unbelievable. They had three different layers of uh, on-site manager, wasn't really on-site, but let's say the daily manager, then a manager of him, then a manager of that guy. And, you know, there was this whole process they had to go through because they were used to some large jobs. Don't know why they took ours. Ours was a, a million one, I think, was the job size. Um, and they just messed up, completely messed up. So when the day was done in their world, they had a spreadsheet that showed they'd spent a million five or a million six in costs. Who knows what costs are and what's real and so forth. And these guys aren't the kind of guys that we're in the boxing ring you know, hey, you know, we're not going to sue each other. We just want to work something out. And I always profess, do not ever sue anybody. Always work something out, um, no matter how painful it is, because it's going to be just, it's going to save years of your life and a lot of your money. So the guy, um, we paid him in full this million one, um, and then he leaned us for another million dollars. Well, my contract was for a million one. You can't just lean me just because you want to for another million dollars. And he basically excused the language to fuck you. I'm big. I just go and send this over to in-house legal and we start the ball rolling. And I'm looking at this and I'm trying to get my permanent financing. I've got this lien. 
Um, so long and short is I, I have a very good friend that's one of the presidents over Turner Construction. He knows this guy personally. He helped me work it out and mediate this thing before it got real ugly. Um, and I ended up paying an extra couple hundred thousand dollars over his million one contract. Well, the funny thing is of the couple hundred I paid him, 100 was real legit and the other one wasn't. So let's say I paid a hundred more than I should have, but the next bidder was $500,000 more. So effectively it, it all worked out, but the pain and suffering that goes through, um, is it tends to be pretty brutal. And this is the kind of thing where you can't shrivel up and go into a ball. You have to stand up, push that ball and um, move forward. But we've had, we've had a building burned down. Um, I don't want to tell you what we haven't had because I don't want it to happen, but um, <laughs> we never had a, an earthquake happen during uh, one of our buildings, but I do buy earthquake insurance during the course of construction specifically for that situation. So um, the other sort of thing to remember here is, you know, in insurance, you can never buy enough and you should never use it because you use it and they're going to take it away or they're going to make it way more expensive. But in over-insure yourself at every situation. Stop eating before you get rid of your E&O or your general liability insurance. Um, I know I'm kind of drifting all over, but uh, um, there are some other crazy things that have happened. Uh, buildings burning down during the course of construction. Um, when <clears throat> we had a project, we have a house in Idaho where I went to school, University of Idaho in Moscow. Um, we have a house in McCall and we went there for the Christmas. This was back in 98. Uh, we came back down and one of the investors in this deal, this apartment deal says, hey, do you see all the fireworks? And, uh, you know, haha, that's kind of funny. He goes, no, check it out. Look at the TV. So we put the 11 o'clock news on and one portion of our building was caught on fire by a homeless guy that had his Bunsen burner in there. And the Bunsen burner um, just torched down basically, what was it, eight of the 32 units. So immediately I had to go get the insurance in line, take care of all this stuff. Um, we rebuilt the building and then when we rebuilt it, somehow waterproofing wasn't done properly by the general contractor. That's when we had general contractors and uh, the whole building leaked. So then I went for my first party insurance and the first party insurance during the actual use of the building basically paid a half a million dollars out and then it stopped. They said, we're not paying anymore. We believe this is a defect issue. You know, go after yourself and you're out. So then. I took on two high power attorneys in LA uh, without an attorney because I didn't want to spend the money. And we went through an arbitration process, um, a mediation process and basically stuffed these guys. And I got another half a million dollars on that, but that was kind of a crazy turn of events. Um, again, this stuff is basic stuff. And if you can kind of think properly, you can do most, if not all of it yourself. I don't suggest you take on a couple of attorneys out of LA, but it's strange how we actually, I actually knew more than they did um, in their craft. And uh, the mediator was just so sick of me, um, just beating these guys up. He just said, uncle, I'm out, get the hell out of here, write this guy a check. And uh, it worked out, it worked out for itself. So I'll think of more it, anecdotal things too. <clears throat> you just said that um, you don't have general contractors anymore. How does that work now? Are you self-performing that piece of it? Or yeah, we had, oh, here, there's another situation. We had back in 2000, we had a general contractor that absolutely had to get their name on downtown. Downtown was just starting to happen. We had a 45 unit project um, that we were doing. His name was John Wayne, John Wayne Construction. And I'm telling you, there must have been 30 banners around this property. It was a 25,000 square foot lot. And, and he had basically underbid the project. And at that point, we were just going, we don't need these losers anymore. It's unbelievable how they put their hand up. You do all the work and um, they get the fees and so forth. Um, and so he walked off the job and he put a bonded stop notice. You can put a stop notice down, which basically says I'm stopping work. The bank gets all twisted up. But when there's a bonded stop notice, the bank by law has to stop distributing funds. So um, I didn't have, a whole bunch of money. Um, I think I had a hundred thousand dollars in the bank. I sold three cars, um, sold the building and raised a whole bunch of money. So I kept the project going. Um, and these guys eventually, um, went back to mediation cause you don't want to sue anybody. And the mediator just handed them, you know, their head and we got a quarter million dollars out of those guys. Um, uh, and they walked off the job and that was it. That was the end. We no longer want general contractors. My theory was if you draw it, you build it. So 
that point, we had maybe four or five people in the office and we had a couple projects going different phases and so forth. And they would go out and they'd be the superintendent. I mean, if you draw the drawings, you know where it is. I, I can't imagine having a project, a complicated project, not that ours are complicated, but a real complicated project. And you come in and you have to basically start reading a book, memorizing what page all these you know pieces of information on and build a building. Um, but if you draw it, it's pretty simple for you. And then you can pare down your drawings <clears throat> or, um, Drawings don't have any specifications in them. All the specifications are actually in the contracts for the subcontractors. Um, the subcontractors now indemnify us, the architects and the owners. So when something happens, excuse me, um, you're protected. You're not protecting someone else. Uh, it just is kind of like everything kind of gets real smaller and tighter and, and lovelier. And, and, and instead of blowing up and getting larger and more complicated, um, there's no job directors, no RFIs, um, no hate mail, no delays. Uh, it's just a different way to do it. I'm not saying you can do every project like this, but it's certainly a different way um, of looking at doing architecture. And it's worked out extremely well for us. Um, we, I just got sued for the first time in 30 years. It's a frivolous lawsuit, and it was because um, the window manu the installer didn't do his job right and some water got in and then a tenant sued. But we've been pretty much lawsuit free for 30 some years. Um, we've had things like this lien that we worked out. It's always better to eat it and, and write a check um, than it isn't. Um, I'll give you another quick, for instance, and I'm drifting a little bit here, but we had a situation where a property owner sold us a property. It's called Mr. Robinson. Um, the property next door. He owned the property next door. He sold this property. We developed the building. <clears throat> we went through and scraped the whole property. As we went down another foot, we found that his sewer line was running across our property to the street. So um, I immediately went to the, and it broke. So I called, hey, you need to route this around the property. I immediately went to the city and said, is it okay <clears throat> in the code to allow someone else's sewer line to run across our property and get into the, the public right away? And the answer long window was not really, but we'll work with you on it. And this guy, <clears throat> on the other hand, ran his attorneys and then decided to try and sue us, um, saying that we you know, ran over his, his sewer line, which was incorrect because his sewer line was on our property. The long and story in short is we took him to mediation and um, we basically got two parking spaces off his property and he wrote us a $250,000 check for the problem. Um, but it's just working through it and making proper decisions. I moved transformers. I knew going in that somehow he's going to always have this sewer line. So I routed it around. I redesigned the building during the construction to do that. But if that was you know a regular thing with an architect and an engineer and all the other people, it seems like that would end up in a lawsuit. The project would have stopped. I didn't want it. I kept feeding it with the money um, to keep going. The bank had confidence in what we did, and we got through it. So that's long-winded, but... Some anecdotal tidbits. It's, it's a good story. <laughs> uh, kind of amazing story, actually. There's a lot of them. You wouldn't believe them. <laughs> Mandy, looks like we've got something from Michelle here. Yeah, so just segue your um, talking about money. Uh, Michelle, well, I don't, you you know Michelle Hoddle, right? Down in mm -hmm. San Diego. Yep. Yeah. So she's, she's saying hi to you and she's excited to see you on here, but she actually okay. has a question for you. Um, how do you get the money to develop? And would you recommend getting independent investors first or trying to finance it yourself? Depends what you're doing. I think it's really important you start small. So small, small would be doing your own house. Um, that typically takes 20 to 30% down. If you're doing a larger project, obviously you need more money. Um, at, at some point, now, so I've struggled with this. You know, we could have scaled up our company and probably had <clears throat> two or three times the amount of units and so forth. But if the investors own half the units, you really don't have two or three times. You have half of that and half of that's what we have. So uh, in the beginning, build your own house. Um, you should be able to do your sweat equity. I call it Johnny Bucks um, with the architectural um, fees you're going to get with the general contractor's fees, with the superintendent fees. <clears throat> you may be doing some of the sub trades yourself, framing, what have you. Um, start small, build your house, and then maybe go to friends and family and ask for some funds. Um, you want to make sure that those people don't have any ownership of what you're doing, though. You're just borrowing money, you're going to pay it back. And that may take a personal guarantee. But 
the last thing you want to do is give away your talent um, to these people and let them prosper from all the good decisions you're going to make. That's going to make your building more effective, more um, financially effective and um, less expensive to build. Uh, it, it's just, it's a problem the way I do it versus the typical fee developer will just be going in there and all they want to do is make fees. They're never going to own any building because they're never going to be able to recover <coughs> because the preferred return to the investors is going to eat up all the profits such that you'll never pay down that unless you sell the building, but you get any funds. Um, it's more important that you do your house, do a four unit project, get rental income, lever up into a six unit, eight unit, 10 unit. Um, maybe you can even sell the smaller ones in it. 1031 exchange into larger ones. Um, but you'd be surprised how it sort of works. We got up to 250 units again. Um, we sold, I think, 70 units for $45 million last year. Um, and we paid the government a little bit of money, too. I bought some bombs and some fuel and, and stuff like that for the military. Um, but you know what? It still was, you know, in the 30% um, tax category versus 50 because of... Uh, the capital gains versus ordinary income. And I'm glad to take a um, little money off, off the table and, and pay a little tax rather than continuing to lever in and lever in and lever in. Um, you know, you gotta, st you know, the, the, was it the pigs get fat, but the hogs get slaughtered. Um, no profit's a bad profit, no loss is a good loss. Just try to slowly take baby steps to get where you are and then hopefully you won't get hurt. It, it seems like a, and sort of a foundational theme to all of this, though, is go going back to the idea of the architect actually getting paid for their talents, I think is how you how you said it a minute right. ago. Right. And that's that's really what you're leveraging here, isn't it? When you say leveraging, remember, in the, in the scheme of things, about 17 percent of the cost of a building is in fees that you're going to, you can potentially get yourself, not including, let's say a developer fee, because some banks don't, don't look at it that way. Um, they want to wipe that fee out. Um, so if you can take a 35%, if it's cost a hundred dollars, $35 has to come out of your pocket and their bank's going to loan you $65 of the $35, about half of that can be fees. So if you can keep your day job um, and do this on the side, when I mean day job, it could be, your own architectural firm or working for somebody or, or doing something else um, while you're building your first house, which as I see a comment here, you know, the banks are more than happy to lend you on that. And, and they'll lend you the, the better money than I get. They'll lend you money that says, here's construction money. And when you're done with construction, we'll lock you in before you even start construction on your permanent financing. So I know today I can start a house and in 12 months when I'm done, I could care less where the interest rates are at because I've already locked it in going 10 years forward. Uh, when I do my buildings, <clears throat> I go on and get a construction loan. The construction loan's done, then I got to get permanent lending. Um, so back to the, the, the general question you asked, about half of the money that you actually need is your fee that you can defer. So if you can live um, without those fees, um, then you can defer them. So instead of taking that $17 <clears throat> and let's say you're in the 50% category, you had to make $34, pay the government 17 of it to end up with 17. Here, it's a true $17. You're getting a dollar for dollar for your, you know, your drawings you show up with. The bank says, yes, those are real. The services you're going to do, yes, those are real. So we'll give you dollar for dollar. You don't have to make twice as much to then end up with cash and then pay that through, and then you don't have to pay yourself. You can just walk away from that, and then you don't have to pay tax on that either. Um, so it's an interesting process. Uh, and I gotta say, you know, I stumbled on all this. You know, I'm not a, a, a super smart guy by any means, a genius or what have you. It's just sort of stumbled on this stuff and stumbled on the way that um, the whole process works with the offsetting depreciation. So I've got an apartment building that lists, makes $100 a year. And there is enough of the building that will actually depreciate a hundred dollars. So the net result is there's a zero. So you pay no tax. You still get the hundred dollars. You know, I don't know any other businesses that are really doing that in that same fact pattern. Um, so it's a very cool thing that architects don't know about that can be um, capitalized and you can 
do really well. We've been very, very fortunate um, financially <clears throat> um, with what we've done. Now, most of your projects are, are resident, well, some, some mixed use and residential projects. <clears throat> does, does this idea, does the architect as developer idea work in other project types? You could do, as you were saying, you did tilt-up buildings. You can do tilt-up buildings, you know, out in La Mesa or down in, you know, uh, just south of the, or north of the border. You can do anything you want. I mean, I don't see you doing a hospital. Um, you could. You know, the hospitals, I don't know if they own their buildings or rent them from somebody or what have you. But anything you can do that you can rent out, yeah, you can do this. Uh, you got to start to understand the equation. I don't like office buildings per se because I don't quite understand <clears throat> the magic of having a 10,000 square foot space that gets cut up into, let's say, three and a half people. Oh, sorry, that has to be a whole. That's right. Three people. Oh, but there's a part left over. You know, what do you do with that? We end up giving that away cheaper. And then one of the persons goes bankrupt or goes out of business. Now you got a 1,500 square foot space in that 10,000 square foot building. But really, the market's 1,000 square foot or it's 2,000 foot. It's not the 1,500 foot. Nothing makes sense. I mean, the ultimate product for me would be a concrete um, box with a window on one end, a skylight on the other to balance the light. And then, you know, a drain in the middle, the people, the renters get out of there and you hose it all down and the next person comes in. It's just, it'd be efficient. It'd be, it would be uh, uh, easily maintained. Um, but the apartment world is now exploding. Not that, you know, I knew it was going to happen, but it's exploding as many of the worlds are. Um, but people have to have some place to live, right? So I would focus on the apartments. Plus the depreciation happens in 27 years on a residential building versus 39 and a half, I think it is, on a commercial building. So your depreciation um, is, is, is a shorter term to offset the income. Yeah, got it. Mandy, it looks like we've got a question from Mark here. Yeah, um, and maybe this is less, I don't know if you actually <coughs> answered it as you were talking, but Mark wants to know, what are the pros and cons of build and sell versus build and rent? Okay, so in the state of California, you have something called strict liability, which means that your building effectively has to be perfect. And if it's not perfect, then it's defective. And if it's not defective, or if it is defective, then someone can sue you to make it perfect. Um, and we have started in San Diego, the incubator of the defect litigation that started back in the 70s. That's taken over. I think every state probably has it now. But anyway, you have a 10 year, you have a 10 year statute of limitations. You have to basically... Um, keep a perfect building for 10 years, even though you don't own it anymore if you sell it. Um, so we try to keep our buildings for 10 years before we sell them. Obviously you want to keep them at least a year um, or you become a merchant builder and then you're not in capital gains or in ordinary income. But um, you know, we're looking at it now, our accountant says, hey, you may want to sell another building. I don't want to, um, I don't think it's the best prudent thing to do, but we may consider it. So I started going through the five buildings that we own and there's one that's passed the 10, 10 years of statute of limitations my favorite building. So I never want to sell it, but that's the one that if we sold it, we can just walk away um, versus if something's under 10 years, which we have a house that we built in La Jolla that's coming up. That's got like um, 10 months left. And <laughs> you just start counting the months. It's crazy. We had a building just trigger um, the past the 10 years in June. It's like, there's another one up. Um, so realistically, if you look at all the, the Jewish boys that have done really well, in San Diego, the old guys, they never sell. They, they Sometimes they 1031 exchange into bigger product, but they just don't sell their buildings. Um, I needed to sell in order to raise the capital. So that's why I did that. So I'd sell a building, take the capital 1031 into another property and build a build, bigger building. But you get to the point now where like the Q building we have is probably worth $35 million. Where, where am I going with $35 million to go build another building? That's a lot of money to have to invest in again to do another building. And I just, you know, I'm at the point now I'm trying to kind of wind down, not wind up. Um, so never sell if you can and don't do a build and sell. That's just problematic and you're going to get crushed as an architect. By it, build sounds, it sounds like a lot of what you're saying isn't, isn't as complicated as we think that it might be, but it's more where's the money and how are you moving the money around? And what's the best benefit tax wise on the money that you're moving around, right? So it's not so much like real estate and and the market as much as these decisions are made based on 
on the money, right? And the taxes and. Well, it's, it's, you know, how much do you have a million dollars? Well, a million dollars means you can build a $3 million building. You have 10 million means you can build a $30 million building. So you sort of have to figure out how much money you have and how, what you want to do. And there's a certain scale at which things make sense. And I think as I, you know, maybe telling you earlier, uh, we have a 23 story building we're doing and our fee that we're never going to take is a million three fifty or something um, that the bank will accept. And then Matthew's doing his, you know, three story house in mission Hills. That's concrete. That's more complex. And his fee is going to be 75 to 125 grand. Maybe the bank will choke that down. I don't know about that, but there's more work in his house than there is in the high rise because it's duplicative and the floors go up. It's the same plan all the way up. Um, so it's kind of weird at a certain scale. It doesn't make any sense to do that. But Matthew's house um, <clears throat> will probably cost him in the low twos and probably worth in the low three. So there's, let's call it a nice even million dollars profit, building your own house, having a great time, being the superintendent. I mean, there's nothing cooler than being out there on a construction site. And, you know, in a year he'll make a million. And then if he holds it for two years, then the government said, we'll give you and your wife a $500,000 pass on any taxes whatsoever. So of the million, half of it's tax free. The other half is capital gains. So effectively he makes a million and he pays, what does he pay? 150 grand in taxes. Whereas if the normal Joe's out there making a million dollars are paying a half a million. So to get back to this, like there is a very, very, very simple program right there. Go build your own house and you could do it every two years. Who's who's your most important or valued consultant? The demons in my head. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's about it. I, you know, I think the accountant's been very helpful. Matt Furman, he's been magic for 30 years. Um, the attorneys are great. You, you know, just make sure that, and, and don't take this as arrogance because it isn't, but just assume you're smarter than them. Because everything is really basic, general math, practical, common sense. Um, the attorneys tend to overcomplicate stuff. I tend to want to get stuff into mediation to clarify and get things behind me. They tend to want to litigate, um, like these these couple of instances I talked about. Oh yeah, we'll crush them in court. Sure we will. You know, I'll lose two like two years of my life being stressed out, and you'll make a bunch of money, and I'll lose a bunch of money. Um, so yeah, it's the most important person, the most important consultant is your own, your own brain and what you're doing and talking to yourself a lot. And I tend to do that a lot, talk to myself, not in public, but, um, <laughs> and try and manage, you know, my expectations of where I'm going. I set up um, every year. I have a three year, two year and a one year um, goal, um, personally, financially and architecturally. And it's strange. Sometimes you just put these kind of crazy things out there and they happen. Um, so, you know, things have you know, happened quicker than I thought and faster and, and better. And some things have been not so much. Um, but, you you know, you just, you got to be, again, not to be trying to arrogant. You got to be confident what you're doing. You don't have to be cocky about it, but you have to, you have to have confidence in yourself. And the first time you start questioning anything, you're done. Um, I never look back. I never double question what a decision I make. I make the decision and I move forward. And if you start to go, whoa, you know, overanalyze something, you'll just kill yourself. Um, there's a lot of big decisions you have to make and you got to be able to take good information. I've had shitty information. I've made bad decisions on shitty information. You didn't tell me about this. You didn't tell me about that. Ask questions. There are no questions that are stupid. The only stupid if you ask them twice and you don't hear it the first time. Um, people may think you're a little stupid. Oh, I don't understand this. Can you explain it to me? Well, guess what? Now you understand it. And it's all basic stuff. And all you have to do is make basic decision off that. <clears throat> I know you have, excuse me, I know you have uh, the Architect as Developer courses, but on a, on a broader scale, should what we're talking about right now Every, everything that you've learned over, I mean, you've been, you've been at this since the, the row houses in the very beginning. So you've, you've learned a lot, obviously, over the uh, 30 years or whatever it's been, yeah. 33 years. Um, should this be part of architectural education, what we're talking about right now? Well, as Bandy was saying, I was just on a, 
discussion panel with the AI of California, and they're trying to have a group to actually change education. And I think, as I said, if 3% of all architects are designers, why are 100% of the architectural students using a third of their entire college education to learn design? It doesn't make any sense. Why? I mean, I remember, I remember the, the teacher, they almost found it like comedy to beat up on the poor guys or ladies that couldn't design at all. Well, why are you putting them through that? That's just stupid. It's almost, that's arrogant. That's cruel. That's arrogant. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's badgering people. That's being bullies. If you don't want to be a designer, but you want to reinvent how sheet metal is put together, go for it. And let's focus on that. Let's give you all the runway you need. Um, we need it. We need to calm down from five years to four years. We need to teach people how to do development. You teach pro practice. My pro practice class was worthless, completely worthless. It was a three credit class. You know, why can't you just take my little book that I, you know, when you do my thing, you get a book, take that book, read through the whole thing and practice and apply something. Learn some stuff, learn the contracts that are in there, learn real life stuff um, <clears throat> and have architects not take any more learning credits, but have the architects have to teach two hours a year. That's their learning credits. They can teach others. There's a better way to do all this stuff. Um, but then architecture as common practice may still be one avenue to get something done. I still think long term you're going to see the architecture profession become <clears throat> a larger set of bad boys. I mean, if I was a person as a business person out there and I had a company that made microchips and I wanted to get a microchip factory together, I would hire a contractor and I would tell that contractor to put the architect under his umbrella because I don't want this. I don't want that bad triangle. I want someone to take responsibility for it. And I think that's the way stuff's going. I mean, you guys can tell me, I don't, I, I don't do any fee work for anybody. I have no interest in it. Um, not when I can do a house like Matthew's going to do and there's a million dollar profit versus a 50 or $75,000 fee of which, you know, I'm going to put twice the amount of work in it, but uh, it's all good news. Yeah. No, I, I think, you know, we talk about this a lot in the community and, and we'll, we'll be having a lot of uh, just based on our guests coming up on context and clarity live. You, I can see we're headed towards a lot of conversations about the future of architectural education and future of practice. Um, and so it, it always energizes me to have conversations like this where, you know, this, is it a different practice model? Absolutely. Does it make sense? As you said, I think it does actually. So, um, yeah, I'm interested to hear what other people in the in the audience have to say about that. But um, but uh, I, I'm I appreciate the approach uh, that you're talking about. Uh, I know we're we're kind of headed towards the top of the hour here, so I'd be remiss um, at not asking about your car collection. <laughs> let, me, let me give you let me give you one thought, and then we'll move into the cars. <laughs> okay, because uh, right. that's that's a pretty important part of my world. Um, we as a profession, I believe, are the best profession there is. I think the architects care more than everybody. They do more than everybody. Um, they want to do better. So the good news for me is there's no way I could have had the impact on our city that I did unless I did it the way I did it. Uh, we couldn't have been creating all the prototypes. Every building was a prototype. It was a new idea, new type, this you know, idea here and here and here. Um, because I would have had to answer to somebody else. Architecturally, schematically, diagrammatically, we were able to do what we want. We had the word control. We controlled everything. Now, was it brutal? Yeah. Did it work out? Yes, we're very fortunate. But at some point in your life, you know, having a million dollars in the bank or a hundred million dollars or a billion dollars in the bank is meaningless if you have no legacy and something to actually physically look back on and what you did. Um, we just got a, a wonderful award from the state of California that there's no way creating regular architecture I would ever receive that award. <clears throat> but the fact that we were able to do what we are do and continue doing what we do, um, nobody in the right mind. We're doing a, a fifty a, a fifty foot by a hundred foot um, twenty three story high rise that's glued to another building that we own, where the two buildings meet. There's a property line because I put an easement on the building I own. 
that stops it at eight stories. From then on, it can have glass. No one's doing this. That's a lot of brain damage. But for us, financially, there's a benefit. But architecturally, there's a benefit. And there's a prototype that's been done. And there's a legacy that'll be there. Um, there's a lot of really ugly, bad buildings that are going up in our city. And I think most cities, if you look at most cities, all these buildings look very similar. It's kind of amazing um, uh, how, how it's not helping our city. But I can say, you know, sincerely that there are a lot of people that are very happy with what we've done for our city. But moving on to the cars, um, we currently have 15 cars. We specialize in one um, genre, let's call it 50s. Um, European Italian cars. Um, we have three Maseratis. We have one that's, um, they're all called, okay, <clears throat> A6G is the actual model. They made 60 of them in 1956. Um, and we have the most important um, existing all original one that we bought in Paris five years ago. Um, and we have the most important convertible one and we have the most important Zagato design coupe. Um, so that's the focus of that. We also <clears throat> have a, an Alfa Romeo that we just restored that we just took to Europe. Um, we have a Lancia that we're getting ready to go to the Pebble Beach with. And then I have three Corvettes because I like American cars, um, three Porsches because I like Porsche cars. Um, and we keep them in a place we call the Batcave, which was put underneath our building. So we built the building and we had the land for free. And then we just built another story below and the elevator takes it down. <clears throat> and that then... Um, is where we keep the cars. We rent from ourselves. And then because we rented, you could um, monetize that and get a value that goes back in the building. We basically borrowed all the money out that we put in. Um, and so now you can ask your question about the cars. <laughs> well, no, but the, the, uh, this is like, this is the chicken and the egg, but maybe it's the car and the developer question. Okay. If, if it weren't for the developments, would there be the cars? Not a chance. Uh, we've been, you know, we've been fortunate. We've made a lot of money on the cars too. Um, but I think all the tides, you know, the tides are raising all the boats at that point. But uh, no, um, there we have a substantial amount of funds and cars that there's no way I would have ever had that. And uh, the good news is, you know, as I talk about these goals, I had the goal of collecting this one Zagato um, Maserati which they made 18 of them, 61 total, 18 were designed by Zagato, the design house. And this is the last car ever made of that lineage. So it was the most refined. And uh, it's certainly without a doubt, the most important car I think I'll ever own in my life. Uh, it's stunning, it's beautiful. It got runner up the best to show at Pebble Beach this year. Um, it drives like crazy. It's a race car with a, you know, with a regular coupe. Um, top on it and um, it's fun it's like another world you know there's subcontractors out there there's wonderful ones there's bad ones i've made a lot of friends we just came back from london we came back from como italy at two different concours um, with the cars and it's very akin to architecture you know these things are these things are um, um, designed um, by design houses like architecture design houses uh, and they're beautiful. And when you take them apart to restore them, you learn about all these inter inter you know, intricacies um, that happen. And uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful um, hobby to have, shall we say. <clears throat> so do the cars inform your architecture in any way? Yeah, big time. When we look at the building, the Polk, I think it was just published on Architizer. If you really study the front of that thing, it's basically a big Rolls Royce grill with the fins in the front. <laughs> And uh, I can't believe they built those fins so perfectly. Um, so, the, yeah, there's a lot of metaphors. Um, the Continental um, name came from Lincoln Continental, and a Mercury from 57 had these these little – the grill basically had a series of little, like I'm going to call them squares that were on there that were a pattern. And the squares um, were something I took as the imagery for making these uh, affordable – uh, micro housing projects and then each balcony then was a square but the square was then made into a delta which is a big 50s move um, on, on European and American cars and so they have these kind of delta pieces to them so all this stuff proportions um, rhythm all that stuff comes back and forth between the cars and the architecture um, that helps us do what we do yeah. <clears throat> 
Uh, it's a great metaphor that ties back to the uh, the Batcave that you've built. Yes. I mean, you, you you sort of glossed over that. I don't know if everybody caught that or not, but you're talking about the Batcave and and how it was built and and paid for and pays for itself and everything else. And it, it seems to me as you, we've had this conversation, and you mentioned control. You said control a couple of minutes right. ago. And I think I, I heard you say this in an interview a while back. You were talking about um, uh, bu- building within your rights, I think is how you said it. So basically, mm-hmm. we're, not, we're not taking input from the neighborhood group. No, thank you. We're, we're not, doing, not doing zoning variances or anything like that. And can you talk about that for a minute? Because I really want the audience to hear you say this for everybody out there that's an architect that has complained about the neighborhood group or the the uh, presentation to the city here in Indianapolis, it's the city county council or whatever it is. Can you talk about that control and building within your rights for a second? Yeah, the worst thing is when you have a homeowners group or community group tell you what to do. It's like, are you kidding me? You don't go to a, a doctor who's going to perform, you know, heart surgery on there and have a group of your buddies just hang out and have him make a presentation and then critique how he's going to do it. Um, I've had groups way back when that would say, you know, your, your buildings look like a prison and there's no glass in it. And, you know, I'm not sure a police station, just like horrible things. You would never want anybody to ever say to you about your work. And you just have to see, sit there and just eat shit in front of them. It's like, no, this is wrong. You know, this is my property and I should have the right to do. So we've always, except for right now with this high rise because of the historic house on it, focused on properties that fell under the radar that had no community input whatsoever. And it's crazy because when you start construction, they go, whoa, whoa, what just happened here? Why is this guy ahead of us? We didn't even know about it. And they get all twisted up and crazy. Um, and it's just, you just, I have no interest in that. You know, I'm, I'm too busy trying to do what I do to hear a bunch of crybabies telling me they want, you know, a pink building or a green building, or they want tile roof or they want, I don't care what they want. If they want that, then go build your own stuff. Because I mean, I think most architects can't even read their own plans. How is a community group person think they can actually read some plans? We just made a presentation last night. I won't get into it. And um, they were just ecstatic over the changes that we had made to the project, making it better. And I said, well, Matthew, what was that? He goes, I don't know, because we didn't change anything. But they were static, and they were like 100% out behind it. And it's like, well, it's the same project we brought before. And uh, But anyway, back to control, back to ideas, back to goals. My goal would be to make a cathedral one day. That would be a wonderful project I'd like to do. How can I do that? Well, I was looking at um, some Quonset huts that my friend Marlon Brown, uh, um, Blackwell was working on in, um, I think it's Detroit for a developer, like little bitty ones. So I'm like, those are kind of cool. And then I looked up those prototypes and man, there's some really cool ones that are like 50 feet wide and they're maybe a hundred feet deep. And they put them on top of these containers to get them off the ground and they store hay under. I'm like, wow, that looks like pretty cheap. So I found out a 50 by a hundred vault. That's a culvert like vault looking thing. Um, is $65,000 for the material. Then you put it together. I'm like, holy shit, that's cheap. So now what I want to do is I want to get my bat cave out of the ground. I'm going to go build a new Johnny Club, and I'm going to have this beautiful vault that's all silver that's made in Iowa or whatever and shipped out here, um, and we're going to have my cathedral. We'll have the, the big church space. It's 35 feet high and 50 feet wide, and it's going to be up on concrete block plinths that will be little spaces and little nooks off the side. So I think you can get to where you want to and do almost any type of a building type um, if you just sort of reconsider how you do it. I love it. So what's it a cathedral too? I mean, is it a cathedral cathedral or is it a cathedral? Well, for cars, yeah, for my car. Just got to get it going, you know, and then I don't know how the heck I'm going to put it together. You put it together with like these bolts. And all the pieces just pulled together. They're about 21 inches wide, and they have about a seven-inch deviation up and down. And they're made out of 22 gauge metal. It's crazy. They span 100 feet or 50 feet. Um, anyway, stay tuned for that. 
we, we've got to hook you up with uh, Earl Parsons, who's part of this community. Okay. He, uh, he's building a Quonset Hut community, I think, on the north uh, north edge of the Grand Canyon, somewhere in that area. Crazy. Uh, he specializes in Quonset Hut construction for residential projects. So, nice. That'd be fabulous. I just don't know how I'm going to put that together. They show you Earl, sort of Earl can tell you on the ground and tilting it up, and it's all flimsy and stuff. So. Yeah. Uh, Earl, yeah, we'll hook you up. Earl, Earl will tell okay. you. Uh, I saw I saw a comment a minute ago, or a question a minute ago, that somebody wants to know. Uh, we were talking about the cars. What's your daily driver? It's probably not one of the Maseratis. I drive all my cars. Today I have my Alfa Romeo 1964 TZ1 out, um, which is possibly my funnest car I have. Um, they made 105 of them. There's about 30 real ones left. It's a 1,400-pound car. Zagato designed it, and it's got 165 horsepower. But I do, I drive Porsches. I have a turbo convertible Porsche um, that um, I drive every day. My wife drives a Tesla. Nice, nice. What's what's the uh, what's the next car you're gonna buy? Um, I just drove a 1931 Alfa Romeo. 1750 um that's supercharged that was pretty crazy so i think <clears throat> at some point i'm going to morph into trying to get it's called a 6c six cylinder 1750 they make a 6c 2300 then they make an 8c which is the most coveted car in the world um 2.9 liter um these cars just rip it's amazing they're better than modern cars built in the 30s um so you know everything evolves right you, you start with seven units and you build a high rise there's an evolution you start with my first car was a 356 i still have it a 1959 sunroof coupe and you start to evolve and you you know you go up and down up and down and you start to get to a resolution where you start to understand cars and why they are what they are what's the race heritage what's the ownership heritage um why were they right for this and that and uh, it's very cool i have an instagram account you guys can look at um, that has a lot of the cars in there. Uh, my Alpha's in there that we just did really well with at Pebble Beach and also Como and, and Hampton Court. <clears throat> I, I love the uh, I love the parallels. Every everything is is tied together here in this entire uh, in, in your entire experience. So uh, I appreciate uh, all of that. What, one last question, then we're going to have to wrap this up because we're at the top of the hour. But for anybody that's here in the audience that has been listening to us and um, is finally ready to take the leap um, to become an architect and a developer, what's what's the one thing that they absolutely have to do today in order to get that ball rolling? I'm not here to try and sell my seminar, but if, I don't know what it is, 600 bucks or something, there's probably $35,000 worth of legal documents in there. If you can get that and just it's eight hours. You get actually eight hours of learning credits through it. I think that'll give you the foundation to understand the ABCs of what I do. Um, always build in your neighborhood because you know it. Like, you know, we're, I'm going to go build a house 30 miles away. And, no, no, no. Build it within a mile of where you live so you understand the product, you understand the neighborhood, you understand the program. Build your house and then build apartments. And you will be looking back one day when you've got all these apartments that are now punching out real money and giving you rent. And, uh, you know, property management's the worst, the worst job you could ever have. Um, but you sort of have to manage your own stuff too. Again, you need to control everything. There's that word again, do everything yourself. You'll be more proud of it. Um, there'll be more satisfaction. Um, and when you're done, you know, you only have one person to blame. That's yourself or one person to pat on the back, that's yourself. Um, and it's very gratifying. It's, it's, there's nothing like seeing one of our models become three dimension. Um, it's just, it's cool. And if you think about it, you know, I was listening to Richard Serra talk about, oh yeah, I've got a $17 million sculpture he's building. Well, we built this project over here, a $30 million eight story building. That's a big sculpture. It's in the city, it's there for everybody, right? It's there forever. And our architects, we do that. We build cities. We make them better. And anything you can do to improve um, the life 
of another person is, is a real positive thing. That is, that is a, a really great way to wrap up this conversation, Jonathan. I really appreciate that. Um, everything that you've shared with us today, I appreciate Thank you. you uh, Appreciate you coming on and, and uh, having this conversation with our live audience. And Mandy, thank you for for stepping in today and uh, being our guest co-host. And to all of, all of you out there um, in our audience, thank you. Thanks. I say this every time, but I really mean it. We've been doing this since April 6th of 2020, and it's only because of you. You have made this context of clarity a thing. If it weren't for you, we would not be having this conversation with Jonathan Siegel today. So thank you for that. And for all of you that are listening to this in the future uh, on the podcast version, I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Um, we will, Mandy and I are headed backstage here momentarily with a mystery guest to break down this conversation and talk about our takeaways. Oh, this conversation with, <laughs> absolutely. Thank you for so, inviting me. This uh, has been fun. I, I really do enjoy talking to other people and inspiring them. I mean, if one person, out of all your group here decides to do their own deal. You know, I've, I've, I've spent my time well. Excellent. I love that. I love that. Uh, I love that attitude. I appreciate that. So Thank again, you guys. thanks everybody. Appreciate you. Yeah. Appreciate you, Jonathan. Okay. And, uh, we'll, we'll see you all again very soon. Thanks Thank everybody. You. All right.